Hello and welcome back to Inquisitor Martyr. Last time we rescued Graxus and that's about it really. Graxus, you have led me to a world with a full-scale demonic outbreak and no cavalier in the docks. Explain. There was a change to the And how you running to Trust old Grex Grexus. You seem to be oddly untroubled by recent events. My unrelenting devotion to the enemy keeps my spirit. That and your bottles of Amazon. So I was looking more at the skills, and I've realized there might be I mean there is something to running like a max warp heat build. Because the more I look at it, there's a lot of abilities that are like, oh, gain bonus damage, gain damage reduction, gain all this stuff while in, like, danger levels. And it's kind of tempting to run it, but I know I can't run it just yet. Just out of the sheer fact that I need a lot of skills put into it, and I think if I were to run it early... It is likely going to just end in my character dying a lot. Which is interesting. It just kind of sucks because I would have to spend a ton of... I think it's memory wipes just to get the character respect for it. And of course at that point a big part would be to mitigate a lot of my cooldown, or not my cooldown reductions, my uh, warp heat reductions, because I need to keep my warp heat high. What were you thinking? You know, there's less value in being low warp heat than there is in high, so I'd have to just keep running. And while that works, I think that's at least for low builds, it'll be risky. Plus, I'd like to get some gear that's built around that. You know, some legendary pieces that are like, hey, run this and you'll get bonus this at high warp heat. Because there's some useful skills scattered throughout a lot of trees that could be really good for a build. Obviously there's one in, I think, health, where lethal damage gets reduced by 80%, and if you still survive the damage, then you get like 200 HP regen for 10 seconds and an extra 20% damage reduction. I mean, that's a good... I'm trying to think of the way to word this. It's good, but it's bad. Because on one hand, it's a great lifesaver. On the other hand, I don't like being in a position where I'd have to rely on that ever. Did you find your contact, Grixus? Waiting for my security screening. These high boys. It's like all the ones that are essentially like, oh, if you die, you revive once every two to three minutes. Yeah, that's really useful, but I also don't want to have to rely on that skill. I relied on skills like that a ton in Diablo 3 at times, and they were good, don't get me wrong, especially in really high level play and like high torment level, but it's just a very sloppy and bad move to sit here and be like, oh, don't worry. I have the self-res. And eh, we'll grab that, why not? And there was one that I liked where it was, I think while your inoculator's on cooldown you get bonus HP regen. Which would really help if you could drag out your cooldown and then load up your inoculator not with healing, but with buffs for like damage reduction and all that 
you could potentially make it more effective healing when it's off cooldown than when it's on cool or when it's on cooldown than when it's off. Do you have any idea how hard it is to obtain an audience with these people in a palace surrounded by chaos? Tell them that the Inquisition is taking care of the situation. Now. But I will say it, it is a little disappointing that it seems like a lot of stuff is high warp heat or nothing. But I get you need less stuff realistically when you don't have that warp heat active. Because there's not as much to worry about. You're not spontaneously spawning demons, you don't have flashing purple death pillars chasing you down. All that stuff is missing, so you don't need to rely as much on a ton of buffs. How many of these guys are they going to spawn? But these captains have some interesting stories about a Herman Van Winter. Did you know that he got his middens on a rare artifact? A strange navigational tool... Take their sweet time spawning more enemies. That's where all his troubles began. I'm not in the mood for your tales. Get me to the Cavalier. You know, I get the whole chaos, like these little psyker guys kind of deal. Reborn Warlocks, but I really think they should have been reworked. Because how often do you trigger them and actually let them summon units? Because I never do. They're usually spaced in such a way that they're the only enemy or one of few. And their summoning ritual takes so long that in that time I can usually kill at least one and then the ritual ends. Reminds me of, uh, Vrox in D&D. &D. How they're like, oh, if you have two or more, they can dance and do this thing to damage players. And I was sitting there thinking, that works. But all you have to do is use, like, any item or any spell that can temporarily incapacitate one, and suddenly that whole song and dance ends. You know, any hold creature or anything similar just instantly negates this entire situation. And that's just how these psychers are too, is the idea is dangerous, and if you were able to set up some really cheesy kind of BS setup, yeah, it could be dangerous. Like, oh, we put the rocks on the top of a tower and they have line of sight to you, but you can't easily reach them. Sure. But at the same time, in that case as a DM, you'd have to look at it and be like, is this set up realistically and believably, or is this just set up to target my players and to it, put some damage on them? Oh wow, my inventory is full. Actually, gonna take a second. Uh... We'll move you there, you up, you up, you there, you there, and pick up at least one more item. If there's anything fancy, I'll just ditch some stuff to grab it. Oh, that was the end. That enhanced attrition isn't bad. Bonus dot duration, increased damage for dots, but then the damage penalty on non-dot effects is a bit rough.
Yeah, I'll go through the purples later. All Imperial Vox channels are reporting a serious demonic incursion. This world is teetering on the brink of destruction. Which indicates that the Cavalier could be still here. Those accursed cults spread the taint of chaos like a disease. The Arbeis channels keep repeating the name of their leader. The blood drink. Ah, uh, I don't know. Maybe that dot bonus might be worthwhile. I it really depends. I'd have to sit down and really start theory crafting pretty hard if that would work or if there's another warp heat perk that would be better suited for that. Because I th definitely think the possibility of running that high warp heat could be good. There's probably a better perk for that slot. Even, maybe even a, you know, an auto revive kind of deal. I guess one of the big things is I'd have to sit down and really allocate points and try to figure out where this build goes. Because very few trees, I think, need like their capstone ability finished. It also helps that this class seems to not really need a capstone in many places. If you're going Pyromancer, yeah, you do heat attacks. You know, crits automatically burn. That's that's a given. The faster you can put more burn stacks, the better. That's not that difficult. And then crits are definitely something you have to build for. Plus, there's one that I'm looking at, which is minus one or two warp heat per crit. Which isn't bad, but I mean, you look at even the staff, each hit is an AoE, so I have the chance of hitting multiple targets, multiple crits. Is that gonna happen? Most likely no. Not seeing a lot of crits though, that's a little... disconcerting to say the least. Starting to worry this is going to become another tech priest or tech adept situation where they just can't crit. Because in that case, it's a complete waste of time to even build crits and then I have to refund some points and... I'll do it. That's fine. I just hate that kind of setup because then it's like, why... Why even offer crits if I can't? Stuff like that always feels like it's designed to almost be like noob bait. You know, we've all seen games where they have that skill or... I can loop it back to D&D. You look at 3-5, uh, the fighters were essentially noob bait. They didn't do as well as any other class. Same as the complete warrior samurai. That was a complete waste. Worst versions of key abilities that monks get. Two weapon fighting. But they're not that good at it. Like shouts. That weren't that good. It really wasn't even a samurai. It was just a Japanese dual wielding guy. But, you know, stuff like that where it's an obvious noob bait to trick people into taking a certain thing. Even if it's unintentional, I assume a lot of times it's unintentional. But it just has so many penalties or so many downsides that there's never a justification. Obviously, a colossal one would be if you can't crit, then crits are useless. You know, then you taking any critical hit ability is a waste, because I tested that on the tech adept one time. As I sat down, I was like, okay, we're gonna give myself some crit bonuses. And I looked and the game was just like, yeah, you still have 0% chance. And that was a 
bit surprised, but also more just disappointed. Captain, I have new information regarding your father's fate. Please tell me it's good news. Your father did indeed acquire a chaos artifact from the word bearers. So, it's not good at all. I strongly suspect that those monsters tried to corrupt the whole. Probably to get their hands on the logbook. It's not over yet, Captain. Yeah, this firestorm around me is useful, but also very dangerous when clearing minefields. I can't just run over a mine and keep moving. <laughs> I've haven't seen a lot for 40k lately. Just thinking about like general news and stuff, it's been kind of quiet. Feels like a lot of games in general have been real quiet lately. I get some people argue, well, that's because of, you know, the geopolitics and doing it out of respect, I guess. I maybe I'm weird. I think it's kind of moot. You know, you're still a business. They're like, oh, we need to keep the bandwidth open for people sharing their messages and I'm like that when I'm looking for Warhammer stuff that is in a completely different sector of things just like me looking at stuff for video games if I want stuff about ongoing conflict I look elsewhere I'm not asking you know Activision their opinions on geopolitics As long as you don't announce, like, hey, this one f conflict has broken out, great news, it's going to be the topic of our next video game, that's something I would be like, eh, maybe hold off on dropping that message, chief, that's a little, a little too soon. You know, give it at least three years. Then sure, you can copy that exact horrific thing. I mean, that's what kind of what happened with uh, a lot of modern military shooters in the mid to late 2000s. You know, it was all, for the most part, all conflicts in the Middle East. You know, war started, like, what, 2001, 2002? Started getting games about it, 2000... Off the top of my head, I think of like 2006, 2007. It was a couple of years. One thing I do find interesting is... Um, so Battlefield 2042, they're like, Oh, it's about global warming and this global crisis that you don't really see anything of because there's no story and they talk about all this stuff and the more I thought about it I was like hang on scarcity of resources fuel becomes more difficult people fighting over resources and land I've seen this story before it's just a new version of the story for Frontline's Fuel of War except we don't get dope drone combat and EMP launchers. Instead, we get specialists that no one asked for. Which, thinking about it, when has having specialists actually improved a game? 
Like, full-on, they have skills specialists. Overwatch? But even then, you could honestly remove the character and just have the abilities and make him look however you want and nothing would change. Like, I find it annoying, because then it's like, oh, you want to play the medic? Well, you are now an old German woman. It's like, well, why? Why am I an old German woman? Why do I care about this character? Especially when I can go into a fight and see six other people on my team alone who look the same as me. Meanwhile, you had games like Frontlines or uh, Homefront, which did near future conflict so much better, but they did not get nearly the respect or recognition those games deserved. I mean, Homefront, Homefront alone improved on Frontlines like drone combat. And especially because that game, that was early 2000s, like 2012. Yeah, we were seeing drones getting used, but not to the degree that we see now. They were really ahead on kind of where drone combat would be. And that's something really big. Like, I've seen them use now... There was, I think it was Libya? They were talking about, I saw stuff talking about, um, they essentially created hunter-killer drones. And what they would do is they would, like, geo-fence them into an area, upload parameters of individuals and vehicles, and then these drones would fly around essentially scan a target, say, does this meet the criteria of this person, this vehicle, this, this, this. If it checks it off, it would autonomously attack. Which, that's even kind of been touched on in uh, Black Ops 2 with the swarm kill streak and the hunter-killer drone. But admittedly, those were far more fanciful and less of just a quadcopter with some C4 bricked up on it. The infamous blood drinker. The man, the Bye bye, blood drinker lady. You're gonna get vaporized. And she's dead. I have the cultist leader in custody. He's incapacitated. Oh, I remember this, yeah. The sheer goofiness of capturing someone when as the assassin I just like headshot her and then this guy just set her on fire repeatedly uh, we'll talk to Metrador just to get that out of the way alright and that is all for now if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit the like button, it helps out the channel a lot. And if you haven't already, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.